as we bow our heads now for a word of prayer, I wonder how many here would like to be remembered just to raise up your hand and let your request be known. All right, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to Thee for this a great privilege that we have of assembling together again before the coming of the Lord. And we pray, Father, that this will just not be an ordinary gathering together, but it be a gathering unto Thee in the bonds of Thy love and fellowship. We pray that You'll save every one that comes to the meeting. Fill those with the Holy Spirit who so long desired it, Father. Heal every sick and afflicted person. May we sit reverently and be quite waiting upon Thee and waiting for the coming of the answer that we've so long prayed for. Bless this pastor, Brother Vic and Brother Bose and all the other ministers, all of our friends. Now we commit ourselves with, with this building to you in the name of the Lord Jesus that while we're assembled here, you'll use us for your glory. Amen. 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 Be seated. <clears throat> it is such a privilege to be here. I long waited the time. The, one of the highlights of, as I said to the pastor this morning, my pilgrimage was to meet Brother Vic and to have this time of fellowship with he and you people. I don't get to New York too often. looks like it's, I live in Tucson, Arizona, you know, and I'm always ministering in, out in the West there. And we're fixing to go overseas now right away for another almost worldwide tour. And so to know that I got to come to New York before going over, I certainly deem it a great privilege and a blessing from God to be here with you. Now, I don't come, uh, as you have known before, to represent any certain church or any certain denomination or any creed. I just love the Lord in one of you. Yes, I, uh, we're just here to serve Him. And now... And we serve Him as, you say, well, as you speak to us, Brother Branham, we're in a, it serves the Lord. Well, as you believe back and together we serve the Lord, Amen. the two of us together, makes the unit. You know, I used to work as an electrician, and I find out that you can have a wire that's got plenty of current, but it's not effective until it's grounded. So when it's grounded, then you get the results, the, the current. So we, we must have both parts of the wire to, to make it work right. And if there would be ever such wonderful speaking and yet no one to believe it, it would be ineffective. But if there's someone to believe it, then it becomes real effective. And uh, we thank you, brother. That's good. I like that. Uh, we believe. Uh, that's what we're here for. And I truly believe that we are uh, just facing some great event. Uh, I trust it's the coming of the Lord because uh, we know something has to give away. The world's under too much tension and there's something wrong. Everyone knows that. And I, I believe that we are facing some great thing and I believe with all my heart that it's the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And I trust that He'll pour out His Spirit upon us and, and will reveal to us the things that we should do to be prepared for His coming. Now, I realize to come here with Brother Vic, his brother, and I, it's a big job because there's been many great men in here, great uh, uh, influential speakers. I was uh, hearing Brother William Booth Cliburn uh, one time speaking of having a long meeting with the Rock Church. Did I say that right? It's a Rock Church, and I call it a Stone Church all the time. So it's always... I... Um, and so, and many other great men who has been here visiting, and I've longed to be with the church myself. And um, to meet men or come in a pulpit where people's listening to such man as that, and your pastor, Brother Bose, Dr. Lee Vale, many of those other great ministers, it, it kind of makes me feel pretty small. But I'm here to do my part in this. Maybe the finger feels pretty small to the, to the mind, but yet it, it, I, it must remain a finger. <laughs> we, we must have it. So now, just a little familiar text so we won't stay too long. A little text that I usually introduce to the meeting and each time try to get around somewhere different. We were going to have a...
prayer line tonight of praying for the sick in a, in a, a prayer line. And my son, which I met the lovely, some of the people of the Stone Church this morning, Rock Church, excuse me. Mm. Brother Bose told me that that was because I was from the West. The reason I call it a, a stone. Now, there they call it stone. Here they call it rock. So I am um, meeting those fine people and they, we got everything setting order. And I said, now I'll go over. And they gave me a bunch of prayer cards, said, take these and have my son to give them out so we can pray for the sick. Well, he didn't know we was going to do it that way. So he and some of the brethren were out and gone and didn't get in in time to give out those cards. But I suppose they've already announced some way they'd be giving them tomorrow, however it is, how they'd be giving them out uh, tomorrow. But I thought then tonight, with a little introduction of what we want to talk about. Now, many people uh, speaking of, of divine healing or any other subject in the Bible, the first thing we find the greatest hindrance is people try to build it either way back in the past tense or way over in the future tense, or it's so high that no one can reach it. Now, that's just the devil doing it, because the Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He ever remains God, and he's just as great with his people when he finds believers today as he ever was. And I believe the word to be this Bible, to be the word of God, Amen. just no more, no less. I know that God can do things that he has not written in the Bible. Because he's God. But as long as I know that what I see him doing, he's written in here that he will do it, then I know I'm right that way. And say, well, he, if he keeps that much, it'll be enough for me. Because I see in there that he was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquity. The chastise of my peace upon him with his stripes I was healed. So that, that finishes the journey for me. And uh, he promised it that we he'd raise us up at the last day. So we're looking for that time to come. Many precious saints are waiting, of course, for that hour. Amen. Now, this God has got to judge the, ch the people, the world. We believe there is coming a day that when God will judge the world by Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, there has to be some standard somewhere that he has to judge by. Well, because so many people today would say, well, I'm even people say they are Christ. And I'm Christ, and I am of Christ, and this denomination is of Christ, or this denomination. Uh, it would be a bit confusing if there wasn't some standard. Now, if I go to the, ask the Catholic people in the building here tonight, do you, what do you think God will judge the world by? They'd say, well, the standard of the Catholic Church. I might ask about maybe some other denomination. Why it would I say, well, the, the standard of our church. They might not write right out confess it but our actions prove that's what we think but then which church would be right see we wouldn't know where to go and then it isn't by any certain group any church any denomination it's going to be by his word okay? that's the standard okay? or it said in the first john uh, saint john the first chapter in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So this is one thing that he can judge the world by that all of us will have to answer to, this book. Amen. And so I trust that God will open this book this week to us in evangelistic messages and in interpretations that he will give himself of his Word just the way it's written and interpret it to us. And then show himself alive here with us to, to, to do that. Now, there's many things that we can say. A man can say anything, I guess, they desire to say. But to God to say it, that makes it right. And then if God says it, and then comes back and proves that he did say it, then there's no question there if it's all, all right. Now, let us, if you want to kind of follow these scriptural texts, I see, I believe you're taking a tape over here. And I believe now before we read, there will be uh, also, I'm to speak on a Sunday, is that right, Brother Vic, on night. Sunday morning or Sunday night. Sunday night? Nights all through the week. Nights all through the week, and no day services, no day services. All right. Now, and there will, how many would like to have a healing service, pray for the sick? Let's see your hands up there. Oh, my. Hmm. 
it's in, a, it's in the majority <laughs> by much, I guess, 99 hundreds and 99 hundreds. It's about, well, that's fine. But uh, we are, now, divine healing is not all the message. Jesus put a, I think they claimed about uh, 80% of his ministry was on divine healing. But as the, the late Brother Bosworth, many of you knew Brother F.F. F. Bosworth, a godly, saintly man, he used to say that divine healing is just like uh, the bait on the hook. You never show the fish the hook. You show him the bait. And, he, and So divine healing is a minor, and you can never major on a minor, but it leads to the major. So we, we see this, and uh, the Bible is true every word, and I feel that we can hang our soul on any Word of the Bible. Amen. It's God's Word. And I may not have faith enough to make it all act out, but I certainly believe that it can be done if we have faith enough to believe it. Yes, it, it, believe it. Now, in the book of St. John twelve twenty, many of you that's been in the meetings before, this will be a very familiar text because I use it as an opening text to introduce what I want to say through the week and what we want to be talking on. And then Hebrews thirteen eight, and um, St. John uh, 12, 20. And uh, there were certain Greeks among them that came up to the feast to worship. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethesda, of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And I want to take just a, a, a five words out of that. Sir, we would see Jesus. And then on Hebrews 13, 8, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now, if he is the same, and our hearts tonight, I'm sure that I speak for uh, quite a few in this meeting, that our hearts are just as hungry to see Jesus Christ as those Greeks were. Uh, we, no one can ever hear of him that would not want to, to see him. Uh, it's been my heart's desire to know the reality and having a, a, a broad experience uh, kind of pays up a little for my lack of education but having dealings with other religions such as Buddha and, uh, and uh, the Mohammed and different types of religions I've seen them around and around the world as I've traveled and looked into them and searched them over but there's only one true that I believe is right that's this Christianity See? and then uh, it's, a, it's the only one that can prove that the founder of this religion is not dead. I, they care, have a horse sitting at the, or standing rather at the tomb of Muhammad. And they believe someday he'll rise and ride the world down and to victory. And, um, but he's dead. He's been dead several hundreds of years. Buddha died about 2,300 years ago. He is a philosopher and, um, in Japan, China. But now our religion of Christ he did die. He had to die in order to save us. But we show an empty tomb. And now his life reflected in us proves that he's not dead. See, And, uh, and his promises. Now, of course, if you'd say that in a foreign nation amongst the Mohammeds, they'd say, yeah, he reflects his life in us. But he never made any promise. See, these promises. But he said, your Jesus made these promises. Now we're waiting to see you teachers perform what he said that he promised. They, that's what the weights are. And uh, that's where they caught our brother Billy Graham, that Muhammad teacher. Well, about said, if this, you just bring so many and I'll bring so many and I'll do as much with them as you will. Well, that was quite a challenge, but he'll challenge that to the wrong person someday. And then, see, now, I would, um, I would believe that, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, according to the scriptures, we are supposed to be written epistles of him. The Bible says that we are written epistles. And if tonight we would hunger and thirst to see the Lord Jesus Christ, we as Christian believers should reflect his life so much to it would be his entire representative. We should be that. Every Christian should be uh, represent and reflect the life of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Amen. And I believe that every Christian should be reflecting the life of Christ. He said in St. John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works I do, shall he do also. And um, then we know that that's true, that we are his representatives. 
And if we claim that Christ lives in us, and if Christ lives in us, then we should do as Christ did. We should reflect his life. What if I said tonight that the, that the life of Shakespeare, what if I said Shakespeare lived in me? Or you said Shakespeare lived in you? All right, you'd write the poems that Shakespeare wrote because Shakespeare lives in you. What if you said Beethoven lived in you? You'd be the great composer that Beethoven was because Beethoven lives in you. You're not yourself. Now you're Beethoven or you're Shakespeare. Then if Christ lives in you, there you are. Mm -hmm. The life of Christ, you live. See, it's just that way. If he lives in you, but you can't live in there with him, he's got to live in you. <laughs> and so it's, it takes your place. And we are supposed to represent him in every way. Now, we find that the first church did uh, represent him as written epistles. His life lived through those people. I could, can't compare our church today as as. Hard as this to say this, as much as I love people, yet you've got to be honest and tell the truth. Uh, I can't say that we see in the churches today uh, reflecting Christ in the way that those people did. They, they know that they had been in, with Jesus. We find in Saint, uh, no, I believe it is in the Acts, the fourth chapter, that we find out that those fishermen, uh, Peter and John, and healing the man at the gate beautiful and was able to answer any question that they, that they, the Sanhedrin asked them, yet they, with their ignorance and unlearned, they per, could perceive that they had no education. And they was not trained ministers. They were fishermen. But they perceived that they had been with Jesus. Amen. See? Because that they were acting the same way he acted on them. You can just live with somebody so long and around them until you take up their ways. And it's good for us not to run off and live with the world, but stay with Jesus until we can reflect his life, be reflected in our life. That's the way those disciples were. They, they knew that they had been around Jesus because they talked like him, acted like him, and healed like him, and every answer was like him. They was inspired like him, and they know that he was living in them. That's what we should be all the time as believers. They acting like him. Because if you associate with someone so long, we find in the Bible over in the book of Kings that there was a man by the name of Jehoshaphat, a righteous man. And there was uh, the son of Ahab, Jerome, and he was taking up the habits of his father. And then the king of Eden. And then they declared war, the Moabites did, upon uh, Israel at that time. And Jerome being king uh, after his father... Why, he called on Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the righteous man, should never have connected himself with this unrighteous person. But many times Christians do that, just not thinking. And so they took a seven-day compass and went into the, the wilderness and come to find out they'd run out of water. And one of them cried, alas, because God has brought these kings out here to slay them. But Jehoshaphat, being a righteous man, in the time of trouble, remembered that God still lived. You see, regardless, of, though we stepped aside and done wrong, yet God is still with us. God still remains the same. And Jehoshaphat, remembering this, cried out, Isn't there a prophet of the Lord somewhere that we could consult? And one of the servants of the king of Israel said back, Yes, here is Elisha. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. Why? Look at his association. See? He, they know this man had associated with a genuine prophet. And they know that if to have that kind of company and stay in that kind of company, he had to walk a pretty straight life. And he wouldn't say nothing because he had been brought up under the tutorship of this great prophet Elijah. Amen. Oh, how it would be today if the church could only stay with Christ under the tutorship of the Holy Spirit. Never leave that word for no creed or nothing. Believe it just the way it's wrote. And man everywhere would know that you'd been with Jesus also. That's how he would know it. But today, it's too bad. We kindly look to a well-trained scholar or something. That's uh, who we think we find Christ in. We go to schools. We send our boys and off to school, to seminaries, which is all right. But we find out they learn how to speak, eloquent speeches, and they make great talks, and 
And they're a fine man. There's no doubt. And thousands of them. And they know how to put the program over. They know how to stand on a platform. They know how to, to uh, introduce Christ to the people. But you come to find out most of that, or a lot of it, too much of it, is just that man not being exactly a representative of Christ, but a lecturer. See? No, he's trained to give lecture. You could ask him to give a, a talk that would actually astound the people from his eloquence of speech and how he could hold himself and how he could hold the people spellbound. Uh, but we find out he learned that in the seminary somewhere, somewhere where they trained him how to do. How different it was from St. Paul when he said, I'll never come to you with the excellency of speech or uh, with wisdom of the world, but in the power of of the Holy Spirit, that your faith would not be in the wisdom of man and his culture, but in the uh, power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Yes, we have another group we kind of, many people look to, is a fellow that we call the good fellow. He stands up on the platform. He's a good jokester. He can tell a few jokes and get all the people laughing. And people who crowd out ever heard to hear those jokes. Uh, and maybe they're not bad jokes. They're just jokes told from the platform. But... I don't think that's right. I, 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 this is no place for joking. This is a place for the deepest of sincerity. That's what's the matter with the church today. We get away from that deep sincerity. we got to be right down to the bottom sincere with this, you see. And then God loves sincerity. And we don't uh, get sincere enough with it. But we find out this person can get everybody laughing and going on. And we kind of look for that man, but... To me, he is called to me uh, maybe an entertainer, but uh, it, uh, uh, maybe just simply a pulpit clown, that's all, see, to stand up there and, and just get the people laughing when there should be in, in the coming of the Lord and the deepness of sincerity, watching every moment for his appearing, for we don't know just what time he might appear. So we don't need lectures, we don't need uh, entertainers and so forth. Then there's another class of people that looks for God, if they was looking for him, and the dress of a person. Many people see a man coming down the street with some great uh, kind of a religious hat on and, and a religious clothes hanging down, and, and they, they think that that's uh, uh, very religious, that's Christ-like. And uh, I don't think so. If that would be so, then... Um, Christ didn't dress like that. So it isn't a dress. The kingdom of God's not in meat and dress, but it's long-suffering and uh, Holy Ghost. They look for the people. Many of them look for the people. Uh, people look for Christ, rather, among their relatives. They say, uh, my mother, she's been a certain, certain member of a certain, certain church for so many years. Or my father come up. And they look for Christ amongst their people like that. My Family raised me up to be such and such. But we don't see Christ. We don't see it. You know, Mary and Joseph made that mistake one time. They were good people. But they went up to Jerusalem to the feast. And on their road back, they missed Jesus among them. And so they sought him among their people, but he wasn't found. And I think that's a whole lot today. And they went trying to find where he was at. Did you know where they found him? Right where they left him. That's right. Well, that's where we'll find him. That's where the church will find him. We won't find him in lectures. We won't find him in entertainers. We won't find him in the way we dress or the denomination we belong to. We'll go back to the day of Pentecost where he came into the church. And there's where we'll find him. Because that's where the early church left him and uh, the Nicaea Council and that's where he's been left ever since. So it's, we have to go back to that time to get him. Go back where we left him. To where we can take his word. And not add nothing to it. Take anything from it. Just believe it the way it is. That's, that's the way it's written. That's what it is. God's watched over to keep it this way. And that's the standard that we'll be judged by. Now, these Greeks were not looking for lecture on Jesus Christ. They wasn't looking for... Uh, pulpit clowns, as I said a few moments ago. They're not looking for that. They're not looking for entertainers. They wanted to see Him, the person, Jesus Christ. They longed to see Him because they had heard of Him. And faith cometh by hearing. Hearing the Word. And He is the Word. See? He is the Word. See? And they wanted to 
see Jesus. Amen. Now, they never said they wanted to hear him. They'd already heard. They wanted to see. That wasn't the question. We would like to hear Jesus. Sirs, we would, we, they, they want, uh, hear Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus. That was their purpose of inquiring was to see. Uh, not to uh, have him explained. Today, with great intellectual messages, we can explain it till you can see the picture. But that, that isn't what we're looking for tonight. We're, we're not looking for the mechanics. We're looking for the dynamics of it. That's it. So, man, see, uh, that's, uh, we got the mechanics of the religions of the Bible so bottleized that it looks like a great big, uh, a 16 or 35 coach train setting out, you know, the track. But if you haven't got any steam in it, then the, the, uh, the, it takes the dynamic to, to, to perform with the mechanics. It, what we need now is to see that this, what we've been taught all these years, is it the truth or is it not? It's been explained over and over and over through the different seminaries and churches and so forth until we are looking to see who this person is. Now you say, Brother Branham, uh, how would you do it? Well, did you notice they come to a servant of Christ? Who had been trained to know what to do. Not to just uh, sit down and say, wait down, you sit down here, I'll explain it. No, he brought them right straight to him because that's what they wanted to see. They, they said, we would see Jesus, not we'd like for you to explain it to us and tell us what it's all about. That wasn't the question. But they wanted to see Jesus and they, God had a, someone standing there, Philip, that could take them and show them to the person, Jesus Christ. Now, that's what we want to see. We want to see the person. You say, well, Brother Branham, we will see him when he comes. Yes, but he promised that he in the person of the Holy Spirit would come Amen. in the last days and would be with us, even in us, to the end of the world. Amen. And the things that he did, we would do also. He said in uh, Hebrews 13, 8, as I have quoted, that he is uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now, there would only be one way to know uh, what he is today. We find we couldn't find him in fine lectures because we find people who can stand up and can explain the word in such a way it's just breathtaking. But when we find it, it's still just a lecture. See? Just a lecture. It's the mechanics. And we find the entertainer who can go through all the actions and so forth, but that still isn't it. We it, that isn't what we're looking for. We find the religious type of their robes on and so forth. That still isn't what we're looking for. See? No, we're looking for the person, Jesus Christ. Amen. The person, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if the Bible said he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he must be that, Amen. or the Bible said something wrong. Amen. Then I don't believe God would judge the world by anything wrong. Then where are we at again? See, we're all out in a muddle again because there's everything this church said. We got it, and we got it, and we got it, and so forth. But if you got it, you'd show it. Amen. Right, see? The person, Christ Jesus. Now, the only true way to find out what he is, is find out what he was. See? Because he's unchangeable. God can never change. He has never changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He must ever remain the same. His word must remain the same. His plans must ever be the same. Now, we have tried everything in the world to get by, away from his plans, but it still remains his is the only way. Man has tried to make a way to educate man to fellowship. It failed. We've tried to denominate them to fellowship. It failed. God has one place that he meets man. That's under the blood. And outside of that, there's no failing. That's right. You got, must have uh, under the blood. Now, if a Catholic priest, an Orthodox Jew, and a Nazarene, a Pilgrim Holiness, and a Pentecostal can stand out here in their denominations and fuss with one another all day long and claim how greater each is and so forth, but let them all come beneath that blood and kneel beneath the cross, they got their arms around one another, and they are brothers because they have, they have things in common. And that's one thing that every born-again believer has in common is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses him. A little story here not long ago of a, a family, a lovely little family is breaking up. A man and his wife had come to disagreement and they were going to have a divorce. And the lawyer told him, said, now, if 
you don't want the courts to kind of take everything you've got, you should go down there and between you and divide the, the spoils up from your family, uh, your union. So they go down to the home and they met on a certain day. They went into the living room and they fussed and they stewed about everything was in the living room. Then they went into the kitchen and they fussed and stewed about what was in there and the different rooms of the house. After a while, they decided to go up into the attic because they had an old trunk up there that had some old antique things that they were laid away. So they went up into the attic to pull out this trunk and they want to say, this is mine, this is mine. And they argue over it. In a few moments, they uncovered something and they both reached for it and their hands crossed. It was a pair of little baby shoes that God had given to their union and had taken away from them. There, who could claim it? It was something they had in common. And with tears in each other's eyes, they pulled the little shoes between them. The divorce was an all. And they found something that meant something to both of them. And I think that Christianity should do the same thing. We can find something that means to both of us. That's Christ. That means to all of us. There we can take each other by the hand and stand there as brothers and sisters in Christ. He's Christ. Now, is he alive? He certainly is. Alive forevermore. And because I live, you live also. Now, we'd have to go back to watch. We know we wouldn't find him as, as a, a great educator. We don't even have any record of him ever going to school. And uh, we, he wouldn't be a different dress man because he went in and out man, a mung man rather, and never, well, people didn't know him. All of them dressed alike. He didn't dress like a priest. He didn't dress like a religious man. He dressed just like an ordinary man. Right and, uh, and then for his... Um, we find out that the Bible wrote in such common language. He must have used the grammar that was uh, used out on the street. It's the common people because the Bible said the common people heard him gladly. See? Right. So maybe the intellectuals could not associate themselves in such a common person. He spoke with the draws and so forth. That perhaps he did. So it was a little too much for them. It is yet today. And that's the reason the Bible becomes such a, a problem to people because it's, they try to interpret it by the higher type of language when it was wrote in a street language. You see, So God humbles himself. God is humility. The man that can humble himself is on his road up. He that exalts himself is on the road down always. So we must remember that Christianity is not pushing ahead and trying to get ahead of this fellow, but stepping back and taking the back seat. You see, let the other fellow go on. That's that's Christianity. Humble yourself. If he sue you at the court and takes your coat, give you the cloak also. If he compels you, go a mile, go two. If he smites one cheek, turn the other. He was our example in every way what we should be. And if that life can reflect in us, people see Christ in you, you see, when, when they can see that. Well, now let's see. There might have been many men. Jesus is different than all men. There might have been many men who could be humble and go the second mile or turn to the other cheek. But we find that Jesus was a different person. Now, God has always stayed with his word. Remember, he never changes his word. As I said a few moments ago about the blood in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve had sinned and God had to keep his law because he was just and the penalty of the law was well, he had to place upon that family because of the wages of sin is death and you're going to die. But then when they become some kind of something and he to have an emancipation of the proclamation, he, he decided that it took blood. Adam and Eve tried to make a fig leaf apron. It wouldn't work. So he required blood and he's never changed. He never changes. And when it come time, a person was sick. And wanted to be healed by God, God healed him upon the basis of his faith in him. He's never changed it. It's still the same, just the same. And any word that God says, it can never be changed. Now, that's the reason I believe the Bible is just the way it's written. See, it can never be changed. We can't find nothing better. God cannot. He's infinite. We are finite. We make mistakes. And tomorrow we know more than we know today. But not God. He is He's uh, eternal Amen. and infinite, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipresent. He, he just, he's God. Amen. If he isn't those things, then he isn't God. Hallelujah. See, he's finite like we are. So we must remember that he is God. Amen. And his words are as part of him. You've heard him say, every man just as good as his word. That's true. God's no better than his word. 
Jesus always referred back to the Father's Word constantly all the time. It is written. It is written. That's how he defeated Satan on the Word. It is written. Now, we find him when he's, he came in the power of the Scripture, exactly the interpretation of the Scripture. But the people of that day that was looking for him to come missed him. Because they had an interpretation that they could not go from that interpretation. They must have it their way. I, it might come the same way today again, you see. It, wouldn't it be too bad if it would? And we've got it all drawn out. And we've had so much schooling that we put a chart and tell you almost the hour he's coming. <laughs> and we tell you where he's going to be riding on a white horse or in a cloud. We know just how it's going to be. And it might be altogether different when he comes. <laughs> he did. You know, those things are so treacherous when it comes to trying to say this is that. Just, just the way the Scripture's written. That's it. Did you notice one time I made a statement like this? One time the disciples said to Jesus in, I believe, St. Matthew 6, 11, or 11, 6, I believe it is, pardon me, 11, 6, I think it is, that the disciples of John came to Jesus and, and uh, wanted to know it, uh, uh, if he really was the one. Now, John had been introduced to him and was laying in the prison. And now Jesus said, just stay until the service is over and then go back and show John what you saw. Uh, he never gave him a book on how to behave himself in jail or something like that or some intellectual speech. He said, you just stay around till the meeting's over and go show John what you saw. And as they went, Jesus watched them as they crossed the hill. He said, what did you go out to see when you went to see John? Did you go to see a man dressed in fine, soft clothes and turn collars and, you know, and so forth? He said, that's of king's palaces. They kiss the babies and bury the dead and so forth. He said, uh, but what did you go to see? A man shaking with a, the wind like a reed? No, not John. You can't tell him, I'll give you so much if you leave this church and come over here to this one. Not John. He wasn't shaken around by organizations and things. Not John. He said, what did you go to see? A prophet? And he said, I say unto you then, more than a prophet. But he was more than a prophet because he was the, the, he was the, 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 the arch between the law and grace. Uh, he was a messenger of the covenant of that day, a great man. And we find out that while well, he was uh, talking, uh, speaking about John and uh, about what a great person he was, he said, if you can receive it, this is he who the prophet spoke of. I'll send my messenger before my face. See, and they said, but then why does Elias say one time when he's speaking on it? He said, why did Elias say that... Uh, that the first thing was, uh, or why did the scribes say, pardon me, that Elias must first come? And he said, Elias has already come, and you didn't know it. Amen. See? Right. See? Those trained men watching for that forerunner of Jesus to come, trained in every way of the Bible, scribes who wrote the Bible, noted from A to Z, backwards, forwards, lectures, my, they were a real man. They know the Scriptures inside and out, every word but yet failed to see that John was the Elias. Amen. Even his disciples never saw it. Uh, wouldn't it be too bad one of these days if we seen the judgment strike the earth and we say, well, why is it the rapture supposed to come? And he'd say, well, it's already come and you didn't know it. Amen. In a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, when no one's thinking about it and it'll be stolen away, you'll never know when it leaves. I tell you, it pays us to be ready. Amen. Say, hey, be ready for this hour. Now, let's take and see what he was. We find as soon as he was baptized, God come upon him in the form of a dove, and he went into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation, and there he defeated Satan on the Word first. He defeated Satan on the Word. Then his earthly ministry began. Now, we find him the first thing. There was a man by the name of Andrew in St. John 1. We find that he went out and got his brother, Simon, and brought Simon to the meeting where Jesus was speaking. And when he did, and Jesus saw Simon, quickly, when he saw him, he told him his name was Simon. And he was the son of Jonas. Now, then that took the starch out of this apostle. And he recognized him then to be the Christ and finally become the head of the church at Jerusalem because he had recognized that that was the Christ. Did you ever think what made him recognize this man to be the Christ? But just saying that, because that the Christ, according to the Scripture, was to be a prophet. 
Moses, their guide and teacher, had told them, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. Amen. No matter how many intellectual men had raised up, there had to come a prophet. Amen. And that prophet had to show the sign of a prophet. Now, perhaps I'm talking to many uh, Jewish people tonight. And you know in the Scripture, the Jew believed his prophet Amen. because it was the prophet that the word of the Lord came to. Amen. Him and him only. Amen. The word of the Lord come to the prophets. Amen. God in sundry times and divers matters spoke to the fathers through the prophets, but in this last day, through his Son, Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 1. Now, the Jew believed the prophet because the prophet had the word of the Lord. Amen. Now, the way they told whether that prophet is right or not was because they watched the prophet. And if he said anything, prophesied, and it come to pass, God said, you hear that prophet, for I'm with him. But if it doesn't come to pass, then ignore what he says. That's no more than right. See, if there be one, a prophet among you, spiritual or a prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in visions, speak to him through dreams. And if what this prophet says comes to pass, then hear him, for I'm with him. But if it doesn't, then don't. So Jesus, standing there, and they had not had a prophet for 400 years in Israel. And here stood a man that seen an ordinary fisherman come up and told him what his name was and what his father's name was. What an astounding thing. What was he doing? He was calling that man. And when that light flashed upon that predestinated seed, life come quickly. He recognized what it was. This man we're speaking of now, Philip. He saw this performed, so he runs around the mountains about 15 miles and uh, to a friend that had been a, uh, a studier of the Scripture with him. And this man, uh, his name is Nathaniel, and he must have had a grove. And so he was out in the grove in prayer by the time Philip arrived, and they were both Hebrews now, watching for the coming of the Messiah. So when Philip found him, he said, Come see who I have found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And, of course, Nathaniel, being a great man and knowing that Nazareth was a, a mean town, and, and he said, could there be anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah. He said, come see. Yeah. That's, that's the, one of the most astounding statements. So many people will, will set off and criticize anything instead of coming and taking it to heart and searching it and seeing whether it's right. If those scribes would have only done that to Jesus Christ, the you Jewish people wouldn't be in the condition you are now. See? And uh, the world, the churches wouldn't be the way they are now. The people, we wouldn't be the way we are. If we studied the Scriptures, and if God raised up something, we know there's a lot of fanaticisms. There's always been. There always will be until Jesus comes. But then well, false prophets and false Christ and everything else is to rise in the world, showing times of the si signs of the times, rather, and so forth. But he said, don't you believe it? See? But now notice, in this, they didn't stop to think who, what he was doing. Philip said, come see for yourself. Yeah. So when Philip and, and, Nath and Nathaniel went along the side of the mountain together, come into the meeting, just about like this, say, where Jesus was speaking. Now, I don't know how they come up. He might have been standing out in the audience. He perhaps might have been up here where Jesus had to, was praying for the sick. Uh, it's, we're not told just what position they were in. But as soon as Jesus saw the man, he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. Amen. Now look at what he's making himself identified when he was here yesterday. See? He never made any great intellectual talks. We have no record of him schooled in seminaries, as I said. He never wrote a book. He never wrote one word. He wrote something on the ground and then tucked his hand and raced it out again. Why didn't he write something? Because he was the Word. That's what saying. If they'd only know. He was the Word. He was the Word itself. Made flesh. He was God made flesh. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Now, notice what he did. When Philip bringing this... A staunch uh, Jew up. He said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. Or some might say, Sure, they could tell the way he was dressed. No. All the Eastern people wore turbans. They wore beards. They wore uh, garments. You couldn't have told him from an Assyrian or any other person. He just had on that type of a garment. He said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. How did he know that he was that just, honest uh, man that he was? He could have been a, an outlaw. He could have been a thief. Uh, come up there with Philip. 
He didn't know. But he had a way of knowing. And he, it astounded this man so much that he said, Rabbi, which means teacher, when did you ever see me? How do you know me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under that tree, I saw you. And what did this uh, scholar of the word know by that? He knew that was that prophet. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. And Jesus said, because I told you these things, you have believed. Now you'll see greater than this. Amen. You see how he was identifying himself, not in a certain dress, not in a great, being a great famous lecturer, or some doctor's degree from some college. It, that, things are all right. I'm not criticizing. I'm trying to pull out something that should come out of there, Amen. see, to show you. Them, the denominations and colleges and dressings, as far as I'm concerned, they're all right. But we're not talking about those things now, see? I'd certainly rather see a man in religious garb than see him like some of these women out here on the street, see? Uh, or something. I'd rather see him, if he's even a fanatic in his religion, I'd rather see him like that and out here drunk somewhere in a ditch, see? So I have nothing to say about that, but what I'm trying to say, we're trying to find that person, Jesus. Amen. That's the person we're trying to find. What about this word? Can that word lie? No, sir. It can't lie and be God. God can't lie. Amen. And this word is God. The Bible said it was. And so now we're trying to find what he is. How could we identify him? Not in clothes, not in denominations, not in speeches. Why are we going to find him? We're going to find him in the person, what he is. Amen. That he is now. Notice, that's the way they know him back there. Not by his dress, not by his education. From his school, he can declare no school he come from. He said, when, whence cometh thee? What school did he come from? We know nothing about this man. Sure, they never had any record of him anywhere. But he, that's the way the prophets come up. They didn't know where they come from. They know nothing about Elijah, about the rest of them. They just come from nowhere and went away. That's all they know. It's man that God can get a hold of. Man like you. That God can get a hold of and declare himself that he might righteously judge a generation, that he might judge a nation, judge a world, because the word has to go forth somewhere. And he sees to it that the elected gets in to hear that. Now we find out that when Jesus was, was speaking and he recognized this, there were those to lead that. There were those who standing there who had to answer to their congregation. There were those there who had answered to their denominations, whether Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, whatever they might be. And so they stood there, and they said, this man does that by Beelzebub. He's a fortune teller, in other words. He's a telepathist. He reads their mind. Jesus perceiving their thoughts. They didn't have to say it out loud. He knew what they were thinking. He caught their thoughts. He's the same today as he was then. He knows what you're thinking. Too. If he is the Word, he has to remain as the Word. Amen. Now, in Hebrews 4, the Bible said that the Word of God is quicker, more powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner even of the thoughts of the heart. Amen. What is it? The Word. Amen. The Word of God can discern the thoughts that's in your heart. That's exactly what he was, the Word, and the Word could discern the thoughts that's in the heart. See? Now, that's what the Word was. They should have known that. See, that, that's the reason he perceived their thoughts, looked upon them. And he said, I'll forgive you for it. For he had not yet been crucified. The Holy Spirit had not yet come. But he said, when the Holy Spirit has come, to do the same thing that he was doing, because he promised it would. See, when the Holy Ghost has come, he'll bring these things to your remembrance, what I've taught you, and will show you things to come. Mm -hmm. See? Now, when he comes to do the same thing that I'm doing, one word against it will never be forgiven in this world and in the world that is to come. See, that's how strict it will be in these last days. It'll separate. See? Then God in His judgment, like He did in Eden, He can justly say, you saw it, you know it, I proved it, and you didn't believe it. That's it. Now, not what He did when He did this, what He said. Philip said, Thou art the Son of God, Thou art the King of Israel. Jesus told him that greater things than this would he say. Now, that was to the Jews. 
Now, there's three races of people in the earth. As much as we, uh, we want to believe that's Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. He's always God is perfect in threes. And there's three sons of Noah in front of them. Three sons brought forth the whole race of people. We find out that the Holy Spirit, Peter, on the day of, before the day of Pentecost, has given the keys to the kingdom. We find out that he opened it to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. And he went down to Samaria and opened it to them. Come back to the house of Cornelius and opened it to that, and he never had to do it no more. It was open to the world. See? The Holy Spirit. But you remember, Philip went out and preached to the Samaritans and had baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Only the Holy Ghost had not fallen upon any of them as yet. So they sent up for him that had the keys, and he laid his hand upon them, and the Holy Ghost came up on them. That's right. As Jews, Gent- and three races of people. Now, we Gentiles, we were heathens, Romans, Greeks, and so forth. We worshipped idols. We wasn't looking for no Messiah. We had no time for no Messiah. We had our own gods, our forefathers. But the Jews were looking for a Messiah. And so was the Samaritans because they were half Jew and Gentile. Now, Jesus will appear to those who are looking for him. Only those, that's all. He's not obligated to the unbeliever, but to the believer he's obligated. He's obligated to raise the believer up. See, in the last day, only to the believer. Now we find that Jesus here had made himself known to the Jew, which we have many others. We can take blind Barnabas, but to save time, well, many of the others through the Scripture, exactly proving to them that he was a Messiah by being a prophet. The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. Amen. That had no prophets. But those who had got away from the idea that he was a prophet had to give an answer to them, so they just said he was a, a devil, a witch, or, you know, some evil spirit doing that. And he said that it was unforgivable sin, calling the work of the Holy Spirit an evil spirit, an evil thing, that the Holy Spirit coming and making his word manifest. Why? It had been prophesied that Jesus would do this very thing. When he told the Jews, he said, well, which one of you can condemn me? Which one of you can accuse me of sin? Sin is unbelief. He said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are the ones that testify of me. They should have known. They thought they knowed it. But they didn't. They'd have known he was the word right there. He could discern the very thoughts in their hearts and so forth and do just exactly what the prophets did. Because he was more than a prophet. He was the God of the prophets. He was the head and the last of the prophets. This day he speaks himself to his church. Now, if we notice in here... That he identified himself perfectly with the Jews, that he was the Messiah, by proving he was the prophet. We know that. There's no other way, not by his dress, not by his talk, not by nothing else, but by being. uh, And then you say, well, he cast out devils. He claimed that the Pharisees done the same thing. He said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, who does your children cast them out by? See? So they were casting out devils too, see? So, but he was cast him out by the finger of God, said, then the kingdom of God has come nigh to you. Now we find out that the thing that identified him exactly being the the Messiah was the prophet because Messiah means the anointed one. And anointed with what? The word. The word anointed is just like a seed with water on it (laughs) in the right ground. It brings forth exactly its promise. That's the reason he said, who can, who can condemn me? Who can tell me that I, if I do not the works of my father, then don't believe me. And the, this is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word is with God and the Word was God. And if I do not want this Word promised for this generation, then don't believe me, he said. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful today if the church could say that same thing? We can stand there. If, this, if we do not do the works of God, then it isn't God. And everywhere God is supernatural takes place because He is supernatural. He is He's a spirit. God is a spirit. Now we find out that he's going down to Jericho, but he had need to go by Samaria. Now, Samaria's around the mountain. Jericho's down at the bottom of the hill. But uh, on his road down, instead of going right down to Jericho, he goes around by Samaria. I wonder why. And he comes to a city called Sychar, and they, the, they sent the disciples in to get some vittles, food. And while they were in to buy this food, he sat down by the well. As well, like a little panoramic like uh, public a gathering place for people coming after water. And it's still there today. And vines growing over the wall. And Jesus was sitting over against the wall. And as he sat there, there was a young lady come out from the city. Uh, we would want to call her today a woman of ill fame. And 
Maybe the child was drove to that, and she, maybe her parents turned her loose on the street. And you know what I mean. And I think the lady, uh, the woman, uh, really, uh, something had happened. We're not told in the scripture, but watch what taken place to that woman's heart. I mean, she come out to get water, and it must have been along about noon. Usually, the maids yet today go out early of the morning and get the water and put it up on their heads and their great uh, earthen vessels, and they pack it to do their drinking water and their housework and whatever they're going to do. And this young woman come out around noon while she couldn't be associated with the rest of the people, the the good people. She could not be uh, caught among them. They would shun her. She felt bad about it, so she'd stay back. She knew what kind of a life that she was living. So she stayed away from the religious people. Now, we find as she come out, she perhaps never noticed who was sitting over against the wall. And those uh, pitchers that they have, it, I call them, they're, they're, some of them call them buckets. they got handles. They're made out of uh, clay, and they have a windle and just a, two hooks that goes in. They let them down into the well and being uh, top them over, and they get full of water and windle it back up, and they pack it on their head and on their hips as they walk. And this woman was just about to maybe hook the hooks over the, the pitcher and was just about to let it down, and she heard a voice said, uh, uh, Woman, bring me a drink. And she looked over to see who it was, and there sat a, perhaps a, more or less like a middle-aged Jew sitting there. And uh, he wasn't but about 30-something years old, 32, 33 years old at the time. And, um, but he must have looked a little older than what he was, because he had been called St. John 6 to be in 50. said, you're a man that's not over 50 years old. And you say you've seen Abraham, now we know you're crazy. You're mad, which means crazy. you got a devil. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Now, he must have grayed up a little or something. He was sitting there, kind of a middle-aged looking man. And he, he said, well, it's not customary. See, there was a, a segregation among them. They had no dealings with each other. He said, uh, it's not customary for you Jews to ask Samaritans favors like that. He said, but if you knew who you were talking with. See, oh, there it is. If we only knew, oh, when we read this, who we're talking with. See. When you're praying, if you only, Jesus said, when thou prayest, believe that you receive what you ask for. If you only knew who it was you were talking with, you'd ask me for water. Now, I bring you the water that you don't get from this well. And uh, the conversation went on a little while. She said, well, our father, see, she being a Samaritan, yet said our father, Jacob, dug this well. And he drank from it and his children and the water of the cattle and so forth. But um, he said, well, you say worship in Jerusalem and, and others worship in this mountain and so forth. He said, we Jews, uh, salvations of the Jews, we know what we worship. But said, hear me, the time's coming and now is when the Father seeks the true worshipers will be worshiping in truth and in spirit. Amen. Spirit and in truth. And the conversation went on for a, a little while. What was he doing? Now, you'll almost have to take my word for this. See? I think. He was trying to find where her trouble was, what was on her mind. Now, remember, the Father had sent him up there. I have need to go by Samaria. Now, he said, and that's St. John 4. Now, in St. John 5, 19, when he healed the man at the gate called Beautiful, we know he, uh, uh, beg your pardon, he's at the pool of Bethesda. He healed this man and was questioned why he didn't heal all the rest of them. Now, that man, there's people laying there who were lame, halt, withered, blind. And here he come walking through there. Walking through this pool. And he went to a man that, I don't know what he had. He might have had TB. Prostrate trouble or something. He was retarded. He had it for 38 years. It wasn't going to kill him. He, was, he, could, he could walk. He could not, but notice, he come right through that pool of people where there's all their multitudes, thousands of them, as he lay at the sheep gate watching for uh, the moving of the water. God's always had a way for divine healing for the people. And so the one stepping in first but had... Enough faith had taken the virtue from the water, and he was healed. But notice, this man, Jesus, come through there, which was the very God of the creation. Amen. And he came through the uh, gate and mangled among the people, just saying, having compassion. you believe he had compassion? Amen. Uh, just stop just a moment and think of this. There's a lady with a baby with a water head, maybe this big around. Passed right by. And here was a man that was blind. Somebody have mercy on me and put me in the pool. The Bible said they're lame, blind, halt, withered. 
Some poor man laying there that probably his arms wasn't that big around, or a little mother with a bunch of children at home, and a compassionate Jesus passed right by her. That's strange. And yet full of compassion. But that's that's the Bible. Can you want to think? And watch, we don't know what compassion means. Notice him. He found a man laying on a pallet that could walk. And he said to him, Will thou be made whole? Why that one? See? Why that one? I watch and he'll tell you. Jesus knew this man had been there in this time, you see, all these years. He healed him, told him to take up his bed and go home, and he did. They found him packing his bed and found Jesus and brought him before the court. Listen to what he said. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing. There's the compassion. Knowing the will of God and then doing it, see? See? The Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees, not hears, not... He, what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. So he must have had a, a vision of going up there. He had need to go by Samaria. And he knew this woman would be there. So knowing that he just to come up there and be at this gate, send the disciples away. The, then he didn't know what to do when the woman began to ask these questions and so forth. So he just waited for the Father to show him. And when he found what her trouble was, how many knows what it was? She had too many husbands. And so he told her, said, go get your husband and come here. Why, she said, I don't have any husband. That looked like a straight review. Why, he said, you have told the truth because you've had five. And the one you're now living with is not your husband. In that, now you have said, right, you have no husband. Watch that little woman. You know, she could teach... 90% 90% of the clergy today hate the gospel. Amen. Why? Why did those priests stand there and call him Beelzebub when their very Bible said that's what he would do? Amen. Is that right? Amen. And here stands a prostitute, a woman of ill fame. And as soon as he said that to that woman, she never said, well, you're Beelzebub. She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Mm-hmm. Now watch your quotation. We perceive, I perceive, that you are a prophet. We know that when the Messiah cometh, which is called the Christ, we're looking for him to come. And when he comes, he's going to tell us these things. This is what he's going to do. That was a sign of Messiah yesterday. That's a sign of Messiah today. It's the same, see. We know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? That was the question. I know you are a prophet. We haven't had one for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Great, 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 great grandfather's letter over here said they had a prophet. The last one, Malachi, 400 and something years ago. We've never had a prophet in Israel since. But here stands a man telling me this. You are a prophet and we are looking for the Messiah. Jesus said, I'm he that speaks to you. That's his identification. That's how he identified himself to Israel. Here he is with the Samaritans identifying himself. I'm he that speaks with you. And upon that, she never questioned it. See, life was foreknown by God. And no matter how much those Pharisees tried to be religious, Jesus said they, they were blinded. He said, well, did Isaiah speak of you? You got eyes and can't see. You've got knowledge and don't understand. You're in a lecture and don't know what you're talking about. You see, you have all these things because, you see, Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that the Father has given me will come to me. Uh, He said that, didn't he? What was it? There was, uh, the Bible said in in the book of Revelations, in the last days when the Antichrist raised up on the... On the scene, so close like the real thing, it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. But And then he said again, he deceived all upon the earth whose names were not written on the Lamb's book of life slain before the foundation of the world. See, their names were put on the book of life, the book of redemption. Jesus come to redeem those that had their names in the book. And when that last name is redeemed, the lamb takes the book and walks away. That's all. Redemption's over. It's closed. Those. And what was she? She was one that had her name there. 
No matter what kind of a state she was in there, as soon as that true gospel light struck that little prostitute, she recognized it. Amen. Why? There was something in there to spark it off. Amen. See? She recognized it. You might pour water and gasoline, it'll only hinder it. But let a little fire hit it one time and watch what happens, you see? It takes the sparking of faith to the Word of God. When they know it's the truth, there's something happens. She never asked one more question. She knew that was that Messiah. Why? He would fully identified himself. Just like Philip said, why, you're the Son of God, the King of Israel. That were there, as I said, that's, he's fortune tellers. That's what he is. He said, you cannot be forgiven for that when the Holy Spirit does it. He said, but now, watch here how he was identified to her. And she ran quickly into the city. And she said to the man, I really, if there's any Easterner here, you, the Bible is a new book to, to a man from the West that goes East once. See, because all the customs, they still live it the same way. She had no right to go in the city and talk to the man. Amen. She could not do it. They would have really wouldn't listen to her. But she had a message <laughs> that nothing could stop her. Amen. She had found life. Something had struck. She ran into the city and told the man, Come see a man that told me the things I've done. Isn't that the very Messiah? Isn't that what we've been looking for? Identified as the Messiah. And the Bible said that when Jesus came into the city, he never did that one more time. Not to them. But they believed what the woman said. And they received him. He never healed any sick. He knew Philip was coming down to do that. So, and... Get him straightened out. Let the Holy Spirit come. So he just let them know that he was Messiah. Now look, there was the Jews. Recognized Jesus. He was identified at the end of their dispensation as Messiah. And that's how he did it. Same way with the Samaritans. They were looking for a Messiah. That's how he identified himself as Messiah. Now, it's been 2,000 years with the Gentiles. They received the gospel. Now, our dispensation's running out the church age. We're finishing He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Never changes his plans. And if he stood among us tonight, he would not be a man with great clerical clothes on, some auditor of speech or lecture or something. But he would prove to us that he was a Messiah. Amen. See? He said, when he's here on earth, he said, As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. Watch this real close. In the days of Sodom, and always, there's been three classes of people. Three is a perfect number, we know. And seven is a completion, 40 is a temptation, 50 is a jubilee. You know the mathematics of the Scripture. But now, notice, at, at Sodom, there was your three classes of people. There was your Sodomites, who were unbelievers. There was Lot, in his group, which were lukewarm believers, church natural. There was Abraham, the spiritual Called out, elected, out into the wilderness, away from Sodom. Watch, three angels came down from heaven one day. The sins of Sodom got about as bad as it is in the world today. They come down. Now, they were looked like man. They were dressed in clothing like man wear, dust upon them, and their feet were dirty from walking. And Abraham, sitting under the oak, saw them coming at a distance. Now, we're referring to what Jesus said to take place at the end time, just before his coming. Now, remember, the Sodomites were Gentiles. <laughs> Notice, now we find that here they come up, these men. And Abraham, spiritually, he noticed there was something about those men were different from ordinary strangers. There's just something when a believer meets a believer. When a believer meets the Word. When something like that woman, see, the... They're ordained to that. They just can't help believing it. There's something strikes them. They, they got it. And when Abraham saw these men coming, he went out and he said, My Lord, will you come by and let me fetch a little water and wash your feet and I'll give you a morsel of bread in your hand and be on your road for... That's what you come by for. They turned aside. Now, and the big master tent was where Abraham lived. And many of his servants, enough to fight an army, uh, lived out around there. They were herdsmen. So he ran in and told Sarah, his wife, uh, to go knead some flour or meal. You know, knead it, sift it like. And make some cakes and put it up on the hearth. 
And, um, and then to, he went out into the herd and found a fat calf and, and killed it and gave it to a servant and said, dress it and make some, some steaks. And he went out and talked to the man. Quickly, he went back and got the flour and the, the, the bread and got the, some milk and some meat and come out and set it down before them. And the Bible said they did eat. They eat. And he noticed the one man kept looking towards Sodom. And he said, I'll not keep this a secret. Two of them gets up and goes on. They go down into Sodom. A modern Billy Graham and an old Roberts. Just going to the down. Go down into the Sodomites to blast the gospel like Billy Graham and them. Did you ever notice? Keep this now. I hope I don't uh, say anything wrong. But we've had... Just spiritually. You must, you must never look at things in a natural. Look at the spirit of anything. Amen. You want to look at a city, look at the spirit of it. You look at a family, look at the spirits in the family. Look at a man, look at the spirits in him. See, anything you look at, everything's got to have a motive and objective. Amen. And um, watch here. Did you know all the great men we've had? Sankey, Finney, Moody, Moody, Knox, Calvin, and so forth. There's never been a man yet on the field with a ministry to the nominal church it ended up with H A M, like A B R A H A M G R A H A M. Never before. He's right in the midst of Sodom. That's why. The man's doing a wonderful work. That's where he's supposed to be. See? H A M means Father of Nations. See? Notice. Now, one of them went down in there to preach to the Sodomites. They went down there. One of them stayed back here with Abraham. Notice. Now, he had been Abram a few days before that. And she had been Sarah, not S A R A H. See, it's R A, and he'd been A B R A, H A M now. And notice he called him by his new name, Abraham. Where is your wife, S A R A H, Sarah? Where is she at? Women then were a little different than they are now. See, they didn't get out in the husband's business. They was backstage. She's back in the tent. So he said, uh, he said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, Abraham, I, personal pronoun, <laughs> I'm going to visit you according to the promise that I made you. Who was that? Amen. Who was this person? Sitting there with dusty clothes on. I'm going to visit you according to the promise that I made you. And Sarah, being an old woman, she kind of, as we would call it today, kind of sniggered, you know, laughed to herself. Me, an old woman, she's 100 years old now, see. Said, me, an old woman... Old and my Lord, which was her husband, being old to have pleasure. Now, we're a mixed audience, but uh, you listen to your doctor and I'm your brother. See, it's certainly as, as, a, as a social affair. It ceased many, many years. See, and so they, they didn't have any family affair. And he said, me have pleasure with my Lord, him being old. She doubted it. In the angel, the messenger, the man, the human, in human flesh, eating the calf of a cow and drinking her milk and eating bread, said, why did Sarah laugh back behind him? Think, think of it. Jesus said, that would repeat again. As it was. What too? Now remember, that one didn't do that down in Sodom. He only manifested that sign up here to the elected group. That wasn't going to be in the fire. Amen. Remember, that was just before the Gentile knowing kingdoms was burnt up. And that's exactly what's going to happen now. Amen. That's what we're looking for right now. Amen. God, Jesus said, will be manifested, otherwise, in the last days in human beings. Amen. As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And remember, the elected never seen any other sign after that. Not one time did God appear to Abraham after that. Nothing else in the world but Sarah was turned immediately to a young woman and Abraham to a young man and they went out and Amalek fell in love with her and wanted to marry and her hundred years old. And they brought forth this child. Why? They were looking for a promised son. And that's what we're looking for today. A promised son. And before that promised son arrives, the elected church is to see God manifested in the flesh, telling the secrets of the heart and knowing the things of the heart. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Remember, the one down yonder in, Bab in uh, Sodom tonight 
giving them a message, a noble brother, Billy, G-R-A-H-A-M. Only six letters, G-R-A-H-A-M. His is A-B-R-A-H-A-M. The messenger to the church nominal. Amen. Blasting it out to them, exactly. And what he did, only one miracle he done, smite them blind and preaching the word smites the unbeliever blind. Amen. Yes, he believed. Of course he believes this, but he was sent, he said, to those politicians to smite him. And that's exactly right. So there he is down there in Babylon of the world. Down there in the in a modern Sodom. Preaching to those denominations. Pounding away. And the people are not even accepting it sincerely. The other night in Los Angeles at the great rally, seen hundreds of times hundreds come up to make decisions. Young people coming up, teenagers, punching one another and chewing, chewing gum and pulling one another's hair and acting, coming up to make a decision. No wonder it's a Babylon. No wonder it's a Sodom. The whole thing's ready to be burned. God is here. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His power is just the same today as it ever was. He does not fail. He cannot fail. He's God. He has to remain God. Uh, sirs, we would see Jesus. Not hear the mechanics, see the dynamics of him. Do you believe that? Amen. Now this week we're going to look for him. Amen. We're going to look for him to walk among us. Hallelujah. And show us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Look, when he was crucified, the old critics, them drunken Roman soldiers, come out there and put a rag around his face and hit him on the head and said, Now if you're a prophet, prophesy and tell us who hit you. See? He didn't clown for the devil. He never opened his mouth and said a word. Of course he knew it. They passed the stick one to another. Said, you tell us who hit you now and we'll believe you. See? That's the critics. They didn't believe it. He was a prophet. But he don't clown for people. These are not sideshows. These are not something, a platform show. It's the presence of Jesus Christ. It's his power uh, among the people. And we must enter it with deepness of sincerity. Satan also, if thou be the son of God. You said you perform miracles. Let me see you do this or do that. He said, get behind me, Satan. Amen. See? It's, written. it's written. That's right. That you shall serve the Lord. Him only shall you worship. So we uh, worship the Lord. Him only shall you serve. Now we know that he is the same. Now, if we come tonight, we find out if Jesus cannot fail because he was God. He is the word. The word in Christ is the same. Then if the word promises, the word, that this is to happen in the last days. The spirit of Elijah is even to return in the last day. Amen. Right. Upon the peoples. And he's to turn the hearts of the fathers, uh, uh, children back to the fathers. Amen. The doctrine, the principles of the Bible. They've got away in denomination, organization. And the great power of God is to come upon the people with a master of peace that will send their hearts back to remembering that he still remains God. Amen. That he is God. Jesus promised that the things that what he did, his believers would do it. The works that I do. Some fellow said, oh, we do, we do greater works. I said, just do the works he did. That's what he said. Say, do that first. He said, well, we got denominational brethren around that's preaching the gospel all the way around the world. He couldn't do it. I said, then do the works he did first, and we'll talk about that. Are you lecturing? But Jesus never said, go into all the world and teach this or teach that. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. Preach is to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. These signs shall follow them. It don't come by lecture. That's right. It doesn't come by lectures. It comes by the presence of the living God moving among in human flesh, proving to yourself that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. He never fails to be the same. It comes so simple. The simplicity of it is what drives the intellectual mind away from it. That's what made them disbelieve Jesus. How could a man... Well, you were born in sin. How can you come teaching us what to do? We're priests. Our fathers were priests. Our grandfathers. We, we know that Bible inside and out. And you try to come tell us what to do? He said, you are your father the devil and his works you will do. See? And well, my, that was a strange thing to say to a bunch of clergymen like that. But... He said, well, we have Moses. We are, we know what. He said, if you'd believe Moses, you'd know me. He said, because Moses spoke of me. Moses spoke of my days. And if you can't believe Moses' words, how are you going to believe me? <laughs> sure. He said, if you can't believe me as a man, then believe the works that I do. They testify who I am. Well, that's the same thing. The great Holy Spirit, Messiah, the anointing comes up on us today. And it produces exactly his life. Just the same as Beethoven would, 
would produce Beethoven again. If the life of Beethoven lived in me, why, I could compose songs. If the life of John Dillinger lived in me, I'd be a criminal. If the life of, of some other person, whatever he was, that would be in me in my life. If the life of Jesus Christ is in you, that's just what you will be. That's exactly. You'll do his works. Jesus said so. I know that's awful hard for people who doesn't believe in the supernatural and so forth. And I'm way late, friends. But let me just say this to you just in closing. Don't, don't, don't close up your heart to it. Come, just be, just be reasonable, sensible. See, Come, read the scriptures and see if those things are right. See if that's the way the world know that he was Messiah. See if that's the way he identified himself. And if he did it then that way to them two races of people, both Samaritan and Jew, because they were looking for him. Now, when we're looking for him, remember, they'd had thousands of years of teaching, over 2,000 years of teaching that he was coming and what he'd be. And when he come, that's the way he identified himself. Well, if he comes to the, at the end of the Gentile age, he's got to identify himself the same way. Amen. Or he isn't the same yesterday. He gave that. If he lets this Gentile age go in under an intellectual conception, then he certainly harmed them. See? Because he performed that to show them that he was that word. Amen. And he must do the same thing. Even though they were taught, they were great religious leaders. They're far beyond what we got today. They were a nation, a nation governed by the laws of the Bible. They were, we were supposed to be, but oh mercy, we all know we're a million miles from it. People couldn't live in them days the way they live now. Man, with four or five women, with wives, they'd be stoned to death and the things that we do today and call ourselves a religious nation. We cannot do that. Uh, they could not do it. Right? They could, uh, we can, but they can't. Because, and they had to be taught. Every man had to be circumcised. He had to be that or he was stoned to death. If he even packed too much weight on the Sabbath day, carried enough ink to make too many letters, he was stoned to death. They had to be religious. And they studied that Bible day and night and yet missed uh, knowing their Messiah when he stood right in their midst when the Bible told him that's exactly what he'd be. Now how we know, if I say, have I got a hand? I don't know where this will make a shadow. I know, it. I know it's too much light. But uh, when you are standing off in the light, you look at your hand, you see what the shadow is. If you've never seen your hand or never seen yourself, if you see what your shadow is, then you know what it will be in reality. Because it's only reflecting what you are. See? Now, we know what Christ was as a shadow way he manifested himself. See? And we know back there what he done. Now, it must be reflected in us. The gospel, Christ, the way he reflected there, the way he reflects it today, that makes him the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Let's bow our heads just a moment for prayer. I ever want just as reverent as you can be for just a few moments now. I'm sorry that Billy never got to give out prayer cards. I I'm sorry about that. We'll give them out tomorrow. I guess at the service or way. Do you have a morning service? No, it'll be a night service. Come tomorrow night about 7, 7 15 and receive your prayer cards. We'll be praying for the sick, the Lord willing. Jesus Christ is a healer. Now remember, friends, there is no man that's a healer. No. There's no man that's a savior. Jesus Christ, he was wounded for your transgressions. Every sinner is forgiven. From Jesus Christ. But it won't do you no good to you accept it. By stripes you were healed. You must believe it now. You were. Not you will be. You already are. But you must accept it. Now you believe it with all your heart. Say, I was just thinking, by the way, how many here really believe it on the first night? Raise your hands. Believe what I've told you is the truth. Amen. Let's pray. We won't wait for any prayer cards. The Holy Spirit just as great now as He was if you had prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Prayer card don't need them to give you. Out your head. I want to ask you something. One time, Jesus of Nazareth. If you ever catch me doing anything unscripturally that this Bible doesn't say, you're duty bound to come to me. See, to tell me. Jesus Christ said, oh, when He was here on earth, He was going up across the sea and He stopped. And on His road, there's a man come to Him. Uh, by the name of Jairus, and he was, his little girl was very sick, and she was dying. Frankly, she died before he got there. And there was a woman, perhaps lived up on the hill, that had heard about him. 
And her faith really believed that it was. He was the Messiah. So there was many of the scribes and Pharisees standing by saying, Don't you listen to that man. That man will get you all tore up. You were confused. You'll be leaving the synagogue. He, he won't, you won't know what to believe. Don't you listen to that man. But that didn't stop this little woman. The Bible said she'd had a blood issue for many years. And she'd spent all of her living and give it to the doctors. And the doctors, no doubt, had tried hard to help the little th- woman. But they couldn't do it. She still had a discharge of blood. And she's pale, perhaps sickly looking. And all of a sudden, she heard, what's the noise down there on the bank? They said, that prophet from Galilee is coming by. That Jesus, see, Jesus is a common Jewish name. I'm acquainted with many people named Jesus. Right where I live there in Arizona, I know three or four men right there, even ministers named Jesus. But this is Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, see, the Son of God. And this prophet, Jesus, was coming by. She knew that, that he was a prophet. And she knew that God was the Word and he come to his prophets. So she said, if I can only touch that man's garment, I'll be made well. Are you acquainted with the story? Amen. All right. Remember, she pressed to the crowd. Now, anyone knows the Palestinian garment. It has an underneath garment and a robe. And it swings free as they walk. All men, women, and all wore them. And they down low and they have a uh, like a stocking over their, their legs and things to keep the dust and stuff from settling on their limbs. And as they walk, of course, the garment picks up the dust. And um, so as they passed by, she perhaps had to crawl around them. And everyone was putting their arms around him. Rabbi, so, so, some of them saying, well, he's, he's nothing to him. That's the mixed crowds. We always have it everywhere. But this little woman come through and touched the border of his garment. That was his outer garment. Now, you, I'd never feel it, or you wouldn't, if I touched your coat or you touched mine and it laying against you. This loose Palestinian garment hanging that far from his feet, of course, he, physically, he never felt it. And she touched her, his garment, went back, sat down, or whatever she did. Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? Is that true? Amen. All right, now watch. Now, that was Jesus yesterday. And nobody said nothing. And he looked around. Upon the audience, till he found where that faith was. And he revealed it to her. He said, Thy faith has saved thee. Your blood issue stopped. Is that right? Thy faith. Now that was Jesus yesterday. Now, is, now the Bible said, Now I know there's many ministers and great able scholars sitting here. Now doesn't the Bible say in the book of Hebrews 3 that he is right now a high priest ever living to make intercessions Upon our confession. Is that right? A high priest, ever living to make intercession, and can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? Now, if you touched him, how would you know you touched him? He'd act the same as he did yesterday. Is that right? Now, if you touch him, him, not someone else, him, touch him. He's a high priest. And you touch him by the feeling of your infirmities, Lord Jesus I am sick. Uh, I must die. The doctors tell me I can't live. But somehow, or I've spent my money. Uh, I, even I can't afford to go to a doctor. And uh, whatever more, if what your trouble is, or even I haven't been to the doctor, whatever it is, and say, Lord God, I'm your servant. And if you're not, say, I'll be your servant. I, I believe you. Something about what's been read tonight and said to me, that sounds like the Bible. And it, I've read it, and I know that's true. And this man tries to challenge our faith here. Challenging our faith right here in New York City, New York, and telling us that you remain the same. That you right now are a high priest and will act upon the same thing. If I can only touch you, Lord, let me touch your garment. Now, how would you know it? Now, the only way you know it, I know that Brother Bram doesn't know me. And he's just a, a man. He's just a man standing there. That's all. He knows not, nothing about me. But if I can touch you, then you speak to him and let him speak to me because God only works through the agency of man. How many knows that? That's exactly. He never does nothing outside of man. No, sir. Does nothing until first he reveals it to his prophets. Is that what the Bible says? That's his preachers. Now, you believe it with all your heart and say, Lord Jesus, let, now don't be, don't be nervous, excited. See, you press yourself. You jump over the top of it. You try to make it something well, just simple. How many in here is a stranger to me and sick? Let's see you raise up your hand. Say, I, I need healing, but 
practically everyone. I don't know anyone here exactly to speak to, or to know. I know this brother Anthony is sitting here. Uh, that's about, and I brother I believe that's brother Tyler sitting right there. I believe. Is that is it, brother Pat Tyler? Amen. I, I, I thought that. Now, just to know anyone else, I might might have seen you, and you might have seen me. But the heavenly Father knows I don't recognize anyone at this time. Back in here, yes, I know this boy is sitting here taking tapes because he's one of our tape boys. And outside of that, his father must be here somewhere because I think they're together. Are you here, Brother Stothman? Where are you at? Oh, it's way back in the back. Now, you yourself. I know we're getting late. And we, I guess we should have been out of here long ago. But just just a moment. There's one thing to say anything. And there's one thing for God to prove it. Right. Now, if I say that you got a right to... Di- no, you have no right to disbelieve it because I'm reading it out of the Bible. Amen. See? You don't see. But now, if God confirms that to be so, then you'll know whether it is or not. Now, yes, in humility... Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord Jesus, I know this is a great challenge. It's a challenge that maybe I, I, I should not have made. I don't know. But feeling that many of these people have been in meetings before. They, they know you. And they know that you, you are in the earth today. And they know that you, you keep your word by representing yourself through human agency. And Lord, if you'll just speak to even one person or two or maybe three, and said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Make it at least three people here, Lord, unknown to me, that you will speak to them and let them touch your garment. Then let me just see the vision and know what to say, that the Holy Spirit use my lips uh, as you have in so graciously Lord such an unworthy person and there's none of us worthy none of us but somebody must do it so I I pray God that you'll do it tonight will you just that it might be known this great city which is doomed for judgment shortly the whole world we know can't stand in this condition and there may be people here that'll never be again maybe that's why I'm doing this saying this I pray Father that you'll make this word that I have preached it's your word let it be made known in Jesus' name. Now just keep your heads bowed and just pray. Say, Lord Jesus, let me touch your garment. Now when you're finished praying, then you just look up this away so that you might be, now I'm not saying look to me. You all know that. As Peter and John passed through the gate called Beulah and said to the crippled man, look upon us. That didn't mean to, in other words, pay attention to what I'm telling you. Now you pray and say, Lord Jesus, Brother Branham doesn't know me, but you know me. You just let me touch your garment because he just told me you're a high priest. That can be touched by the feeling of my infirmities and told me you're the same yesterday and forever. And that you would react just the same way you did then when that woman touched your garment. And it'll certainly take all the doubt away from me. Well, I'll know then that you're the same yesterday and forever. And then the scripture will be fulfilled. Exactly. We can know Jesus tonight as we know him then. Sirs, we would see Jesus. If I walked in with nail scars in my hand, I'd be, could be a hypocrite. You wouldn't know him by that. You wouldn't know him by the way he was dressed. You know him by his life. That's what identified him as being God's servant prophet. I just pray and have faith. Here's a lady. I don't want to say nothing to her because you can see what's wrong with her. A lady sitting here. I think it is. She's got a garter she's praying about. It doesn't show on her neck, but you can look at her neck. Yes, it when she pulled her skirt back, it does. I don't know you. If you believe with all your heart, that'll go away from you. Yes. I, 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 if you just, just have faith now, just don't doubt. Just pray and just say, Lord Jesus, I'm waiting to touch your garment. Reveal yourself to me. You say, what are you looking for, Brother Brandt? Vision. Now be real reverent. Don't, don't move around. See, see interrupt. Just be real reverent. Here, watch this. Look at here. Here's a lady right in here praying, sitting looking right at me. I see dripping of blood. It's in the stomach. She's got a bleeding stomach. If you believe it, is that right, lady? Raise your hands up. 
I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you, but that's true. It just now stopped. Mm-hmm. Your faith. Jesus, we believe, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to ask you, what did the woman touch? I do not know her. I've never seen her in my life. It's just a woman. That's all I know. Mm-hmm. Here's a lady up here on the end of the, out here towards the end of the row. Just then I've seen it happen. It seemed like it flecked to another lady. Just then. That's her. She's got back trouble and she... Uh, something wrong with your back. Put your hand over on the lady next to you. She has something wrong on her back too. All right. She can't hardly get up and down. The lady sitting next to you is going blind. This other one on this other side is going blind. I want you to put your hands on her too. That's right. That's right. I believe with all your heart it'll be over. Now watch what happens. You believe? Amen. I see a dark shadow hanging right back here. It's over a poor woman. She's going to die. She's got cancer. If God doesn't touch her, she must die. I'm sure she'll... God help me. Mrs. Cater, if you believe with all your heart, Jesus Christ will make you well. You believe? K-A-T-U-R. If you believe with all your heart, Jesus Christ makes you well. Stand up, lady, and give God praise. All right, you can go home and be well. i never seen a woman in my life. i never seen her in my life. She's a total stranger to me. You say, well, you called her name. Well, that's no more. Jesus called Simon's name. Told him his name is Simon, what his father was. Is that right? Yes. Sirs, we would see Jesus. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. Don't you believe that? Don't you believe you're right in his presence now? How many believe that? We would see Jesus. Now, Jesus Christ... Now, it wasn't me that healed those people. I hear it goes again. All right, just have faith. I'll tell you what you do right now. You believers, lay your hands over on each other like this. See, put your hand on someone next to you. Jesus, I'm going to quote the last words he said when he left earth. These signs shall follow them that believe. Did you say you believe? These signs shall follow them that believe. Of course, we have belief and we have unbelief mixed. We always have that. There's always three classes of people. Believers, make believers and unbelievers. And we have that too. But your prayer now, where you're sitting, have faith for the person you got your hands upon. Jesus Christ said this. Remember, now, if you do not believe, be very careful because these diseases go from one to another. We know that. We read it in the Bible where evil spirits went out of one right into another. And we see it all. Many of you have been in the meetings and see it. If that's right, say amen. Sure, people paralyze and strike dumb, die right there in the meeting and everything. Now, in the way that you pray, you don't pray for yourself. You pray for the one you've got your hands on. See, you pray for them. And now, if there's a person in your while they're connected like that, that is not a Christian and won't accept Christ as your Savior, would you make it known by just standing to your feet? Say, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior right now in His presence. I want to stand up to show to this congregation I'm a testimony to Jesus Christ. I'll accept Him right now as my Savior. If you've never did this before, you have the privilege to stand. Now, he'll, you stand for Him now, He'll stand for you later when you're, you're at the judgment bar. If you're not a Christian, accept it now. And you that's got your hands on one another now, pray for each other. Now remember, they're praying for you. You pray for them. Now I'm going to pray up here with you for all these people. God bless you back there, my brother. God of heaven, be my... That's very fine, a gallant thing. Would there be another would stand and say, Jesus knows you. No man can come. God bless you, sister. That's fine. Just see the presence of Jesus Christ. Come into the meeting and do exactly what he did in the scripture. That's totally impossible for a man to do that. It takes a spirit to do that. Now, if you want to call it like the Pharisees, the evil spirit, then you receive that reward. And if you call it the Spirit of God, then accept it. Accept it as your Savior, for He is Jesus Christ, His only Savior of the world. And He is he's God's Son, died for you. He's here tonight in the person of the Holy Ghost. He is still Jesus, still Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Ghost, which is Christ in spirit form. If you never accept him as Savior, would you just stand up, you know, and he'll witness for you if you'll witness for him. Some stood up. If there's another, right quick before we pray. Uh, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. 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 In his presence, that's fine. Manny, that's fine. God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you way back. A man already stand. Raise his hands. God bless you. God bless you. That's good. God bless you. That's wonderful. That's right. Take him right now. Remember. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, there isn't a life in here that could be hid 
from God right now. Well, what he could reveal to me, just exactly, you know that. You, many of you have been in, all you've been in meetings before, you see, take massive turns, say amen. amen. Yes, sir, you know it's true. And right now, I know there's people here that ought to surrender themselves to Christ. Please do it. Please do it now while you're, oh, while you've got the chance in his divine presence. Oh, check up. We may be later than we think. Right now, when he, his August presence comes in and blesses us and proves with the scripture, here he is. A word confirmed. Eight or ten people, right? You're healed, sitting right here. And it's more. If you'll take my word as his servant, that light that you see in the picture that science has right here in Washington, D.C., as the only supernatural being ever taken, that light is just circling this building around, 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 around. Now, that is right. Now, you believe. Jesus Christ said the last words he said when he left the earth. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. And he was received up into glory, and they went forth everywhere preaching. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Pray for each other now while I pray for you from this pulpit. Lord Jesus, the Son of God who rose from the dead on the third day. Death and hell could not hold him. He ascended on high, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The where he ever lives to make intercessions upon our confession. And now, in his vital presence here, in the form of the Holy Ghost, that's done the work and perceived the thoughts that's in the people's hearts, told them their diseases, pronounced them healed. Oh God, to see your great mighty work, know that in this tangled, mixed day, full of politics, full of church politics, full of all kinds of things. Yet the living God is right present with us here tonight. No lecture, no nothing but the evidence, the Holy Ghost, right in our midst. Jesus Christ performing these things as he did when he was here on earth. Oh, God, be merciful. And Satan, you see the hands of these people laid upon each other. You are a defeated being. You cannot no longer hold these people. I uh, charge thee in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that you turn these people loose and come out of them. Come out, sickness and affliction from these people. I uh, adjure thee in the name of Jesus Christ that you leave them. Believe it now with all your heart. If you believe it, stand up to your feet now and accept it. Put up your hands to God. Say, I now accept my healing, I believe. Now raise your hands and give me praise. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah.